Before I ask Sarah to begin today's session, I'm, uh, I take this moment and I would like to thank everybody, the attendees, for logging in and for making themselves available for today's session. Um, before I ask Sarah to begin, a brief about Education USA. Education USA is a US Department of State funded global network, which uh, brings together over 450 advising centers spread over 170 countries of the world where uh, the team of advisors come together to assist student applicants, prospective applicants who want to study in the United States. Uh, with this, I would like to um, welcome Sarah and thank her for joining us and ask her to begin her session today. Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Um, so as uh, was mentioned, I work for Pepperdine University just to kind of give you um, a little bit of background. I've actually been at Pepperdine for over 13 years. So what I'm sharing with you is over the years, we've received a number of different applications. I'd like to always give applicants some tips on how to pull together the best application, how to find the best program when it comes to looking uh, looking to study in the legal, legal program in the United States, just by way of starting. Uh, to give you a bigger background, legal education in the U.S. is uh, offered a little bit different than a lot of international locations. In the United States, legal education is offered at the graduate level uh, rather than the undergraduate or bachelor's level. Uh, law schools will typically sit within another university environment. So uh, typically, uh, you know, for example, there's the Pepperdine University is a bigger umbrella. There's usually a business school, law school, education, psychology. So there's usually some structure within it. There are about a few handful of law schools that are standalone schools, um, but typically they sit within another university environment. There are actually over 200 law schools in the United States. So when it comes to choosing the best program, there are a number of different choices available to you. Um, of, of those students, there are 141,000 law students in the United States that are evenly split between male and female students. One of the elements that I always recommend that applicants look at when it comes to choosing a law school is to look at levels of accreditation. So in the United States, there are two levels of accreditation for law schools. Uh, you'll see on the left-hand side, this is called a regional level of accreditation. So the purple would be California accredited law school, or it would be, the green would be like a Northwest accredited law school, or there would be a Midwest, uh, 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 like a um, Northeast accredited law school. And so when it comes to looking at levels of accreditation, especially for international applicants, I always recommend that you limit yourself to the national level of accreditation, which is the highest level of accreditation in the United States, and we have, that's the American Bar Association, or ABA. There are over 200 ABA-approved uh, ABA programs to choose from, so you've got a number of different choices. And the reason why I recommend that you limit yourself to ABA, regional accredited programs may be easier to get into, um, but uh, there are some challenges when it comes to qualifying for a bar exam. You may not be able to qualify. And when it comes to actually getting a job, they're not as highly respected as ABA accredited programs. Um, before actually applying uh, to a law school in the United States, I always recommend that applicants take some time to do some self-reflection. Think about why are you looking at studying? What are you hoping to do um, after completing a program in the United States? Are you looking to specialize in a particular area? Are you looking at trying to work in the legal field in the United States? Are you looking at trying to go back to India uh, and work within the legal, legal field? Are you trying to build a career internationally uh, in a general area or specialized area? By thinking about why you're looking at attending a legal program in the United States, what you're looking at doing, if it's whether, whether it's just preparing for a bar exam or whether um, it is um, just getting specialized knowledge by thinking about what you want to do, that will then dictate the type of program you should go to in order to meet those goals and requirements. There are actually three different types of legal uh, degrees in the United States. And so the first degree of law is that Juris Doctorate, so that is typically a three-year full-time program. Uh, the second 
option is that master the law, which is the most popular option for international candidates. Uh, for many people with a Bachelor of Law program, the LLM or Master's of Law is what uh, applicants will take typically to qualify for a, one of the bar exams, whether it's New York, California, or um, one of the several bar exams that you can qualify for. And then the third degree in law is the JFD or the FJD, uh, which is the Doctor of Law. That is a three to five year program. Uh, just to go into the JD program in a little bit more detail. It's the JD program, again, as I mentioned, this is the first degree of law in the United States and it's typically a three-year program. Uh, with the JD degree, many law schools will have different approaches in regards to uh, how, they're, how the curriculum is structured for that JD program, but essentially many of them are fairly similar. You're still going to take your contract, your course, your civil procedure. Um, there are going to be some elements that may differ slightly per school. Um, and so some of these specialized programs where it may be a summer internship or a special certificate you can get as part of a DD, et cetera, are, are elements that can help you, that can help sway which program that you would choose to, to complete that JD program with. Um, but typically, um, for the JD degree, you're, you're taking this program in order to help prepare for the bar and really give you a better understanding of, of uh, U.S. law. Uh, again, like, as I mentioned, the most popular option uh, for international candidates is the one-year advanced degree in law, which is the LLM degree. I describe the LLM in two ways. Uh, you will have law schools that will offer a general LLM. So this is a law school that has opened up their JD curriculum, where they will allow international candidates to come in and take courses, maybe to prepare for a bar exam, maybe you want to better understand U.S. law. Um, but the, those general courses I kind of describe as kind of the buffet of legal education. You will have some requirements, but you can kind of go through and pick and choose um, how you want to go through that, that particular LLM program. The second type of LLM program is what's called a specialized LLM. Uh, these are LLM in tax, tax law, LLM in international law, LLM in intellectual property. So these specializations have a specific curriculum that you would have to complete of both the required and elective courses. One of the elements that can be a little bit of a challenge is if you're looking at sitting for one of the bar exams in the United States, again, the two most popular options are California and New York, uh, both of those bar exams will require that you're taking full of the 14 years of coursework as part of your LLM on courses covered by that bar exam. So if you're doing a general LLM, no problem. You'll have enough electives that you can keep those units as part of your LLM requirements to qualify for one of those bar exams. Now, if you're doing a specialized LLM, this is where you'll have to do your research. Some specialized LLMs don't give you any elective courses, where they're only, they're only giving you into the courses you have to take in order to earn the LLM without much flexibility. There are other specialized LLMs that will still give you that specialization, but also give you electives where you have the flexibility to take those courses required to the bar. So by, again, doing that self-reflection to figure out what you're looking at doing, why you're looking at doing, and what you're hoping to do once you complete the program, that will then let you know ahead of time whether or not you want to sit to one of the bars there. Or again, when looking at specialized programs, you make sure that you ask the administrator for that particular LLM program whether or not you'll have elective uh, courses for you to be able to uh, take the courses required for one of those bar exams. And then the, the last thing would be uh, Doctorate of Law or SKD program is, is the highest of uh, the legal degrees in the United States. The fifth, this is typically a three to five year program. The application process for an SKD program will differ slightly from what I'll be mentioning a little bit later because with SJD programs, they're a little bit more directed. Uh, typically, when you're applying for an SJD program, uh, they may want a research proposal. They want, may want to know what exactly you're looking at doing. Um, I always want to make sure that this is on your radar simply because some SJD programs, one of the blanket requirements is it will require an LLM. Very few will accept an international LLM. Many of the SJD programs in the United States will want a U.S. LLM. And some are so specialized that they will only accept students from their LLM program. So if your end goal is to 
teach and become a faculty member at a law school and focus on a certain area of specialization. Even at this point that you're looking at LLM programs, to know um, if you have a special green SJD program in mind, look at what their LLM requirements are so that you know whether or not you, should, you can uh, have the flexibility of choosing your own LLM or if they're going to require that you get an LLM from their particular institute. So just in your picture, make sure that you keep this in mind if you want to be able to be a researcher or faculty in the field. Um, what I'm seeing, and I always like to mention this, at least in the international format, is there's a, a trend in um, non-traditional law degrees. And so uh, over the past couple of years, more and more law schools are opening up additional alternative programs to the, to the legal education. So typically, a law degree is considered the JD, the LLM, or the SJD. But more and more law schools are opening up masters of law programs, masters in legal studies, or alternative masters, legal degrees. Um, but again, if you have a qualifying law degree, so if you have a law background and you have an LLB in law from your home country, I really require, I really recommend that you limit yourself to a JD, an LLM, or an SJD program. Um, these non-traditional non degrees are typically for those that work in business, human resources, maybe they deal with contracts and want to better understand, but these will not make you eligible to practice law. These will not make you eligible to sit for the bar exam. And so I always like to mention this because even the differences in how we teach legal education, the name of the degrees can be fairly confusing. But these masters of legal studies or masters of studies in law are great options for non-lawyers uh, looking to understand legal concepts, but it will not help you qualify for a bar exam. So if you have a legal background, focus on the typical law degrees, which would be the JD, LLM, or SJD program. One of the biggest questions I get are from applicants who are really trying to decide whether or not they want to do a JD or an LLM program. This is becoming more and more popular as um, more and more students are doing LLM programs. Um, they're trying to look at what, what would be a better fit for what they're doing career-wise. I always recommend to applicants to think about what you're looking at doing with that particular degree. And so going through and doing an LLM program will qualify you for a U.S. bar exam. You could go through and pass the bar. Um, but the challenge is being competitive in the job market. Um, and so when it comes to actually working in the United States, if you're looking at actually building a career here in the U.S., I always recommend to applicants look at the JD program, simply because you've got three years to actually go through the legal education, which increases your ability to pass the bar exam, um, but also gives you three years of internships and clerkships and additional work experience in order to network in the United States versus a one-year LLM program. Um, NYU did a study a couple years ago uh, that asked international law firms regarding whether or not they wanted candidates uh, applying to their law firm to have passed the U.S., specifically the New York bar exam. And only 13% had said that it would be nice. But what they were really looking for were um, associates that had specialized knowledge in a particular area. So when they received that intellectual property case or environmental law case or whichever area of specialization, they actually had an attorney on staff that could handle um, some of those cases. And so if you're looking at working in an international legal environment, having a specialized LLM may actually do more for your career than going through and getting the qualifying JD degree in order to practice law in the United States. And so again, I always direct the applicants to think about what, what you're looking at doing with the particular degree. If you're working in the U.S., the JD program is a good option. If you're looking at working internationally, then having a specialized LLM will do much more for the career. And in some instances, you may not have to decide between the two. Again, law schools are getting creative now as they're designing new programs. I'm seeing more and more alternatives where applicants can actually do both. Uh, well, they can go through uh, an LLM to JD uh, transfer program where you can start in the LLM, transfer into the JD program. These programs will typically allow you to um, move into a JD program based on grades rather than having to take that LSAT exam. So for some international candidates, 
uh, that's kind of an incentive uh, of not having to take that exam, uh, which is typically required for the standard JD application. Um, I'm seeing other programs that have done accelerated JD programs where they will recognize your LLB in law and the work that you've done there to shorten the traditional three year uh, JD program into a two year program where you can go through and get that and then you can add the LLM to that where in that same three years that you would just be gone from the JD program, you could get both. And so um, you could look for some of these hybrid options if you um, really find value in being able to do both degrees at the same time. I always recommend to applicants to really think about that. Although it's a good deal and although it's a great opportunity, um, it's still your time um, being spent on those degrees as well as money. So just make sure that you're very strategic in what you're trying to accomplish. When it comes to choosing the right school, there are a lot of different options available. So for some people, location can be very important. Do you want to be in a major city? Do you want to actually uh, be in a small town or a suburban area? Or perhaps you have family that live in New York, California, Florida. Uh, depending on what's going on, location um, can certainly be very, very helpful, whether it's the size of the city, public transportation, or some of these other elements. Uh, many applicants will look at reputation of school and faculty. Um, honestly, a lot of students go directly to the U.S. News and World Report rankings. And I always uh, recommend that you be careful when you're looking at those rankings. U.S. News and World Report is a wonderful resource to, for a variety of different programs. But when you're looking at rankings for law school, where that school is ranked is actually reflective of JD statistics. Um, so if you're looking for an LLM program, it's not necessarily going to accurately represent the LLM experience. And so when you look at rankings, um, U.S. News does rank, I would say, about 10 specialized areas. Dispute resolution is one of them. Um, and so if you're looking for like environmental law, dispute resolution, intellectual property, you can look at some of the specialized rankings. That may actually correlate uh, to some of the LLM programs because the specialized rankings are peer ranked um, from faculty members that teach in that particular field. Uh, but I always recommend applicants to look beyond ranking. There's so much more uh, that you can base the reputation on for an institution than statistics. Look at who are the faculty, especially if you're looking at a specialized program. Look at the faculty that teach within the field. Where are they involved? What is their network? Um, as well as other conferences or symposiums or other training programs the school is involved with. Because what you're looking for are opportunities to not just learn the theory, but opportunities to connect with practice. And so the more that law school is involved with the actual profession, where they're doing a lot of training programs, where they're hosting a number of symposiums, where you'll see the faculty are very involved with different committee meetings you know, or organizations, that can really lead to a lot of networking opportunities for students. I was traveling um, in El Salvador this past year and met with one of our alums who was back in his home country. Um, he, at the age, uh, went through our program and at the age of 26 returned back to his home country to become the youngest partner at his law firm. Um, and, and a lot of that was because he was able to get an internship in Washington, D.C. with a very big prestigious law firm um, after doing our LLM program. And he was able to get that internship because of, of one of our faculty members. It was someone that he had known. He picked up the phone and he reached out to his network and he was able to get find this opportunity for the student to be able to do an internship uh, with, with that organization. So leveraging the, the network of the faculty member can really provide unique opportunities for students looking at studying in the U.S. Um, I always recommend looking at course selections in areas of specialty, especially if you're looking for a specialized LLM. Talk to the LLM programs or look through the materials and actually see how many courses are offered in that particular, in that particular area of specialty. Um, one of the kind of biggest differences and that you'll see between law schools is access to some of the doctrinal or JD courses. In some LLM programs, they will only pre-approve LLM students to participate in some of the JD courses. Some of the LLM programs are more of an open book where the students will have the flexibility to enroll in any of the 100 plus courses available within the JD program. 
So if you're looking for an LLM program, asking the LLM administrator how accessible those JD courses are can be very important when it comes to getting access to that maritime law or other um, topic area uh, courses. Um, one of the other unique elements uh, of legal education in the U.S. is the availability of clinical programs. And so in law schools across the U.S., many of them will offer opportunities where students can actually go out there and gain a little bit of practice experience. So for example, we have a mediation clinic offered through our program. Students, of course, are required to take the basic mediation course so they know what they should be doing. Uh, but with the mediation clinic, after you know the stages, you've done simulated exercise, so you know what you should be doing, we actually will give students a bag. We will send them to Los Angeles Superior Court, and they are mediating live cases. Um, so they do a variety of different types of cases, so the students are actually in the courts working and gaining real experience. In order to pass the mediation clinic, students need to mediate at least 24 cases. Um, so even as a student going through the program, they may actually have more experience than a practicing mediator in their home country. Um, so taking advantage of some of these clinical opportunities to really gain some experience can be a unique opportunity for students. Um, and then any special characteristics that may be important to you. So for example, I had a student from um, Argentina uh, that was going through the program and he really wanted to find a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu studio near the campus where he can kind of practice his martial arts while he was going through the program. Um, going through law school in the U.S. is not going to be easy. So finding something that helps you find your balance um, can be important in kind of balancing that dynamic. And I always recommend to applicants, pick a range of schools. Don't just apply to a few. Um, pick a range of schools that you give yourself some options. And when it comes to LLM programs in the U.S., you're going to see them in a variety of different formats, whether they're public schools or whether they're private schools. You will see them vary from maybe 28 to 30,000 U.S. dollars all the way through 60 to 65,000 U.S. dollars. I always recommend to applicants, apply it to a range of them. Don't limit yourself just to the cheaper schools, because realistically, some of those private schools that may have a higher price tag will actually offer more scholarship so that you actually um, may actually pay less going to a more expensive school than you did to a state school that may offer, that may be cheaper price tag but may not offer many scholarships. And so give yourself, give yourself some options. The, realistically, the cost of the application process is minimal compared to the cost of the tuition. So apply to a range of schools so that you, can, you know what your options are. I'm also a negotiation program, so I always tell people to apply to a range of schools so that you also give yourself some scholarship options. And so, you know, when you're applying to a variety of different schools, um, let's say, for example, you have your dream school, you know, you know what you, you know, that's the school you really want to go to, but perhaps they didn't give you as much scholarship as another school, your plan B school. Um, don't, don't be afraid to, to use the admission letter for the Plan B school and ask your dream school whether or not they'll be willing to match that scholarship. Um, by reaching out to the other program, it gives the university a chance to kind of figure out whether or not they um, re really want to be able to match the scholarship because two things can happen. Either that school will either find the funding or have the funding and say, oh yeah, great. You know, I think we can match that scholarship because they offer you a scholarship for a reason. They see something in your application where they want to entice you to choose their particular program, right? And so two things can happen, as I mentioned. They can either have the funding uh, to, to be able to match the scholarship, which is great. You get in your dream school with the dream scholarship. Or two, they, they, they are not able to find the funding, and then you have a decision to make. Um, but realistically, you won't know unless you actually approach and I always recommend use the letter from the other school so that the school sees that you've got a concrete offer. And it's framed in a, in a way that it's, I have a difficult decision, I really want to attend your program, but you know, this, is, this is what I have on my plate. And so you're being transparent. And I recommend doing that rather than trying to um, barter and negotiate without anything, anything providing any leverage. When it comes to finding a school, you've got a couple different resources available. 
Um, LSAC.org is a good option. Um, LSAC is also the organization, uh, or the Law School Admissions Council, is also the organization that manages the online process program, process for the JD program. Um, and so as a university, I actually get an email from LSAC every summer asking me to update our information in the directory. So you more, more than likely are going to have more up-to-date information in LSAC. Um, a couple of other options are LLM Guide uh, as well as Peterson's. It, it just depends on what you're looking for. LLM Guide is an, um, is an option when it comes to online forums. This is where students will typically, or applicants, or even alumni will typically post information or, or, or students are making a decision between this institution or that institution, they can post their questions. Um, so I, I describe it more for chatter. Um, I, I don't quite recommend so much the directory because the directory is biased. Uh, you will have institutions that will pay money to be higher up on the search results. Um, but while LSAC.org is everybody's treated at the same level, you can actually go through and say, I'm looking for a small, medium, large program in California, New York, uh, Florida, uh, specializing in X, Y, and Z. So you actually put in your parameters and it'll actually tell you here are the programs that match your needs. Um, so because of that and because it's an unpaid service, um, you're able to get unbiased information from the directory. And again, re I always recommend that you look at ABA accredited programs. And so the ones in the LSAC directory are ABA accredited. Um, one element that may be a little bit different is how classes are, are, are run within the United States. And so in the U.S., uh, they use what's called the Socratic system, uh, where faculty give a lot of heavy reading before classes will start. So students have to be prepared before the start of class. Um, and faculty will call on students. So when it comes to learning about the law, many of it is you learn by questioning the law. Um, and so in a lot of... Uh, U.S. environments, much of your grade may be dependent on a midterm and final exam. Um, but again, the, the culture of, of, of what it's going to be like in the classroom will vary program to program. There are some LLM programs that are cohorts. So only a certain number of LLM students are accepted, and you will go through all the different classes together as one group, right? Or there's some LLM programs that may be a large program where they may have 100 LLM students. Um, but they're mixed in the classrooms with all the JD students. So you'll have a JD, JD students and maybe 10 students of LLM students in the back. So they're a combined classroom. Um, you may have other programs um, that, that have separate courses. And so, for example, we at Pepperdine, we actually don't use the Socratic method uh, because we teach through role plays and simulation. Um, when you're teaching mediation or negotiation, it's teaching by experience. Um, and so doing some research and learning how the, what the classroom culture is like, whether it's exam-based, we, we actually are paper-based, so at the end of each class you're writing a final research paper. Um, this may help then dictate kind of the, the learning style and how you'd like to go through an academic program. Um, one of the elements that a lot of students will ask um, about is looking at qualifications for sitting for one of the bar exams. Um, in the United States, we're a little different. Uh, we don't have a national bar exam like many other countries around the world. And each of the different states in the United States will have their own bar exam. And so there are 50 states in the U.S., there's 51 bar exams. Now, there's been a more recent trend where New York has jo joined the ranks of a few other bar exams to have um, a, a kind of joint joint exam with a couple couple other states. So things are changing in the U.S. Um, NCBEX.org is a good website to look at when it comes to looking at what is the bar requirement in order to qualify for that bar exam. The two most popular bars for students looking at sitting for international students looking at sitting for the bars California and the New York bar exam, which is now moved into that multi-state bar exam. Typically for the bar, what they're looking for, what is your background in education? Do you have a qualifying degree from your home country to qualify for the bar exam? And if you do, what they typically look for is one year of advanced law study like through an LLM program. Uh, so for many of the different programs in the U.S., you may be able to take those courses required for the bar as part of the LLM in order to sit for that bar exam. Um, some of the bar exams will differ. 
Um, so California is very well respected because it's one of the hardest to pass. And so it's a three-day bar exam, while many of the other bars in the U.S. may only be a two-day bar exam. Um, and so they will differ state to state. I would, I would think about um, where you're going to school does not necessarily relate to where you can qualify for the bar exam. So don't let that limit. Uh, you, if you know you want to sit for the New York bar, you know you can actually go to any school in the United States um, to be able to qualify for New York. You don't have to limit yourself to a New York school. Um, so it's, it's not uh, reliant on where you go to school. So for the application process, I always recommend start early, especially if you're looking at getting funding, because again, look at it from our side, from our department, we have scholarship budgets. The, the later you apply, we've actually been awarding scholarships, so the less money we have to work with. And so give yourself some options. Apply early. Um, when it comes to the application process, for JD programs, they only start in the fall. Um, so you'll have to go through the application process now, and many of them will have deadlines that will end kind of in that April, April time period. For LLM programs, um, I am seeing more and more programs switch from a from a concrete deadline to kind of a rolling admission. And so you will have um, applications due as early as November, December, January. Um, a good portion of the applications are coming due uh, now around the March, April time period. And you will have some LLM programs as late as June. Um, I will be careful with some of those options. If you're waiting until the last minute, keep in mind that you may be limiting your options. because. By the June-July period, many law schools may have already built their class and made their decisions for those LLM programs, so make sure that you apply early. Um, the application process can be a little, little intimidating because there's so many application components that are required, but just know it's just a process. As you're going through and you're checking those boxes, it's all doable as long as you're going through and you're getting your application material. So depending on the program that you're interested in, whether it's a JD or an LLM program, there may be different requirements in regards to recommendations, transcripts, essays, the LSAT, whether or not the pot required, and I'll go over that in just one second. One of the biggest questions I get from applicants is, what do I do with this personal statement? What should I be covered? What is the school looking for? Um, again, keep in mind, look at it from our perspective. In your application, I'm going to see your transcript. So I'm already going to see the courses that you've taken and how well you've done in them. I'm also going to already get a copy of your CV or resume. So when it comes to your professional experience and what you've been doing, I also have a copy of that. So when it comes to your personal statement, don't just tell me where you've gone to school and what you've taken and what you've been doing because that's already in your application. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking at understanding what your story is. Why are you interested in my particular program? What do you hope to do once you get out of the program? And so what I'm looking for is I want you to connect the dots between what I'm seeing in your application. So whether or not you had taken um, a class in environmental law in, in that really spiked your interest where you then did an internship uh, with this uh, law practice that works in that region, and now you're very interested in this LLM in environmental law. So use your classes, use your work experience to really show us what your motivation is, why you're looking at going through the program, what do you hope to do when you get out of the program, and give us a sense of what your direction is. Um, keep in mind that I'm reading the personal statement to see, is this student a good fit for the, my program? And so if you actually take the time to spell how you're a good fit for that particular program, that makes that job a lot easier. So I could see, oh, yeah, this, there really is a good fit here. So I always recommend to applicants, you can have the same structure of what, why you're looking at doing what you're doing, but tweak each personal statement for each school that you're applying for so that it reads that it, like, that, like it's written specifically for the school that you're applying for. So look at some of their courses. Look at the faculty that specialize um, in that particular area and just tweak the personal statement so that it sounds like it's, it was specific to that institution that you're applying for. Um, with that being said, make sure that you also double check your work because I will go get personal statements from an applicant that says, I am a, a really good fit for XYZ University. 
and it's not Pepperdine. Um, so it makes the decision easy on our end, but it may not be the decision you want. So also make sure that you're doing, doing that to double check your work. Also make sure that you are double checking in regards to language, because we will also read a personal statement to kind of get a sense of where the language abilities are of the applicant. So we know you've had many drafts. It's not necessarily the most accurate, but, but bad grammar stands out a little, little bit more in those statements. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see applicants do with that personal statement is, is they'll make it read a little bit too, too legal. Um, if it reads like a journal article, then you've kind of missed the point of the personal statement. It's not meant to be a legal analysis. You're not supposed to show that you are academically qualified to go through the program by writing something a little bit too dense. Um, if you've got too much legalese, uh, you've kind of missed the point on what the purpose is of that statement. It's called a personal statement for a reason. We want to know your background. We want to know why you're a good fit and how you want to go through the program. Uh, many of the different LLM programs will accept a writing sample. If so if you want to submit an article that you published or something else you worked on, some of the programs may accept a writing sample. So uh, don't use the personal statement to be able to do that. Um, when it comes to application examination, I always recommend check with the school that you're applying for, especially for students coming in from India. In many instances, some of the law schools may not require an English proficiency. Some may. So check with the schools that you're applying for regarding their requirements. Um, the LSAT exam is the law school admissions test. This is only required for those applying for a JD program. It is not required for those applying for an LLM. Um, so if you're applying for LLM programs, don't even worry about it. It's not a requirement for the program. If you're applying for a JD program, know that many scholarships are based on the LSAT as well as the GPA. So you do want to make sure you take the time to do well. Um, over the past few years, I'm seeing more and more programs incorporate Skype interviews or telephone interviews as part of the admissions process. Um, I've been doing it for a few years now, and I'm, I know that some of the other schools are starting to incorporate it. So don't be surprised if you've applied for admission to a program and they reach out for you uh, regarding an interview. Um, many of times, many of these like uh, English assessments uh, or these tasks are simply a task. They don't necessarily dictate whether or not someone has a good grasp of the language. The interview process is really our opportunity to get to know you a little bit more and get a sense of you know, your interest in the program. Uh, letters of recommendation. So this is another area where I can recommend that, that applicants be strategic. Uh, when it comes to letters of recommendation, this is another avenue for me to understand who you are, why you're interested in the program, and what's your background and what you're hoping to do, but through the lens of someone else, so someone else's perspective. And so when it comes to letters of recommendation, don't just focus on title. Be driven by the content. What is this person going to be sharing about you that's giving me a different perspective than who you are and what you've been doing? Um, I always recommend to applicants to to focus on giving different people that give us a different perspective of who you are. So give us that faculty member, give us that internship supervisor, give us that work supervisor. There is no perfect recipe in regards to letters of recommendation because it depends on what your story is. For someone that's just graduating out of an LLB program, I'm going to expect majority of those are going to be academic or internship related letters of recommendation. If you've been out in the field for five, six, uh, years and you've been and you're giving me all academic. There's a gap there because you should be giving me some some work recommendations as well. So again, be strategic in who you're choosing, um, especially if you're applying for a specialized program, a specialized topic area. Try to get a recommendation from a faculty member that taught a class that you took in that specialized area because it not just tells me how you are in the classroom, but it, that you have a specific interest in that particular field. Um, so be very strategic in who you're choosing. Um, some people say that they want you know, the president of the organization or the dean of the law school. But if I'm just getting a letter of recommendation from the dean that confirms this was a student in our program, that's not really adding anything to your application. I can see that from your transcript. But if you get the vice dean uh, that maybe supervised your thesis, that can tell me how you problem solve the situation and we're able to move past something, 
then that's going to actually give me more information to work from. So be very strategic in who you're choosing for those recommendations. Many programs will require two or three letters of recommendation. Um, also check with the schools and how they will receive them. Um, some recommendations are done off of a form. Some recommendations are written narratives. Um, some schools will make exceptions and accept them via email. Um, so check with the schools. I know at Pepper and I, we will take them via email if they're from verified uh, corporate or university accounts. So check with the school. Uh, the Law School Admissions Council. So as I mentioned, this is the avenue where many people will use to apply for law school. So if you look uh, for that first tab, the first tab is future JD students. That is the one-stop shop for anyone applying for a JD program. Your application will be in there. Um, all JD programs are re required, actually, to use LSAC um, to, to go through that application process. Uh, for LLM programs, that's the second tab. Uh, LLM programs are kind of split half and half. For LLM programs, there are some LLM programs that will only accept an application online through LSAC. There are some LLM programs that will give you the choice where you can apply directly for their program from, from an online application or a PDF, or you can apply through LSAC. So the LSAC does charge money to use their service to apply online, so I know some LLM programs give you alternative options in case you don't have the extra funds to help cover that cost. Um, what's nice about LSAC is, as I mentioned earlier, there's the directory where you can do the searching to find the particular programs you're interested in, but LSAC actually has a free service where instead of just relying on you searching the directory to find information, you can actually register yourself, put down your area of interest, and the schools can, can do it, that match your requirements can actually reach out to you. Uh, and say, hey, we see, see your interest in environmental law. Here's some information on our upcoming program. And so by registering for their, they call it candidate referral service, CRS, it's free. You put in your contact details, and schools can reach out to you with information that match your needs. Um, evaluation agency. So this is one of the elements that can really delay an application. So depending on the size of the LLM or JD program that you're applying for, some schools will require that you have your transcript evaluated by a third-party service. I always recommend the applicants start here because the evaluation process can take two weeks, at least two weeks, to go through. So if you start with the evaluation process and have the LS law school, LSSC or, or other third-party organization evaluate your transcript early, you will then have two weeks put together your personal statement, to put together your recommendations, to put together the rest of the application, so that by the time you're done putting everything together, the transcript is done being evaluated and can get released to the university that you're applying for. Um, and so this will vary program to program. Some schools have someone on staff where they will not require the evaluation process because they will do that in-house. Other schools do not. At Pepperdine, we're not that big of a program, so I don't have a staff member that does evaluation or transcripts, so we will require an evaluation process. So make sure you check with the schools that you're applying for and see what their requirements are uh, in regards to evaluation. Um, sources of funding. This is kind of a big topic area. For many students, you know, they under studying uh, law in the U.S. can get expensive, and I describe sources of funding two different ways. You're either um, getting funding from the university itself, which I describe as internal scholarships. These may be a fellowship, a grant. This can be a scholarship offered with admission, or it could be a scholarship requiring a different application, whether it's an application form, an essay. Um, but this is something that's received directly from the university. Um, the second option are what's called external scholarships. These are by third-party organizations like Fulbright, the Rotary. Um, there are a lot of organizations out there who, whose purpose is to promote the cultural exchange between countries, and they provide funding to help students that are looking at uh, going outside to study uh, outside of their home country. These will have different deadlines, so please make sure that you are doing your research, even for some internal scholarships. There may be a separate application process. Um, I think I have a slide. Okay. So this just goes over some of the Pepperdine scholarships available. So for the JD program, much of it is based on uh, GP and LSAT score. But I mention this because um, 
we have both partial scholarships that are considered at the point of admission. So once you apply for the program, uh, you will receive congratulations. You've been admitted to Pepperdine's LLM program with a scholarship of 10, 15, 20, um, $25,000, depending. Um, and so that, that those, there's some scholarships are automatically considered just as part of the process. But we also offer a free full tuition scholarship. But those full tuition scholarships will not only require an application for admission, but it also requires two paid statements. So those statements are actually due coming up next week on March 3rd. Um, and so check with the schools that you're applying for and see what those additional deadlines are. Um, for us, if you apply for the full tuition you're awarded, uh, that will actually replace any partial scholarship you may have been awarded at the point of admission. So do check with the schools that you're applying for. When it comes to these external scholarships, again, you're going to have deadlines that are due maybe a year and a half before you plan uh, on applying to the academic program, or you will have some that will uh, allow an application for funding like Rotary after you've gained admission. So really do your research and plan ahead. Fulbright, for example, is, you know, many of the officers are accepting applications now for 2018. Um, so make sure you do your research. Uh, there, as an example, these are a lot of the different organizations that offer scholarships to those looking at studying uh, in the U.S. Some of them are offered by topic area. Some of them are offered by region. Some of them are offered by demographic. Um, so, and some of them will vary from a few thousand dollars up into fifteen to uh, twelve thousand or fifteen thousand dollars up into a full tuition scholarship. Um, so make sure you do your research. There's a lot of organizations out there um, that will provide funding. And then as I've traveled the world, I actually kind of look at this as community service. I will post the scholarships on our website, and it doesn't matter if you're going to Pepperdine or some other program. Um, I look at this as just an opportunity to kind of share the word if I've found an organization that's willing to, to pay. Um, to help fund students study in the U.S., I've posted this on the website, and you're more than welcome to reference this uh, in case you are looking for additional funds. Um, and then uh, just to mention briefly, uh, just to give you a little bit of background on Pepperdine's program, um, there's a lot of different programs available because we're a school within a school. There's a ton of different joint degrees that you can do with the JD or with the um, business program or public policy program. There's a lot of uh, different special institutes and programs within the law school itself. But what we're known for is our dispute resolution program. We've been the number one ranked program by U.S. News for 11 of the past 12 years. Um, but we've got a number of different programs available depending on what you're looking for. Um, this upcoming fall, we're starting a new program in U.S. law and entertainment media sports law. And then we have a series of different um, dispute resolution or international commercial arbitration or international law and business type programs available for students looking at study uh, in, in the U.S. Um, I do want to make sure I open it up for questions, though. Um, and I think people can should be able to type in the chat box and I can respond uh, to the questions as they come up. But I do want to make sure I, I can address some of the questions uh, for those that are that are chatting in. That is a, okay. So I see Deborah's question. Besides faculty networks, could location play a role in finding internships, and what kinds of locations would those be? Um, certainly, that is the case. There are certain um, areas within the United States that will have a lot of law firms or a lot of um, specialized areas. So, for example, we're in Los Angeles. So, there's a Los Angeles is one of the big hubs for the field of dispute resolution. Um, so when it comes to finding internships for students, there are a lot of different opportunities available. But also know that just because you're you're studying in a school within that particular region, it doesn't mean that you have to do an internship in that region. I mean, for us, our students will do internships in Los Angeles, in New York, in Washington D.C. Um, I think I think it's leveraging the uh, connections that that program may have. We actually have on our staff an externship coordinator who manages the relationships with the placement organizations that we work with. And so it's looking at what connections that university has to put you in different places. 
Um, certainly, uh, being close to a major city or major hub can be very helpful. That way you can study and then on Tuesdays and Friday afternoon, you can do that at the same time versus having to fly off to a different destination, finding additional housing and the logistics of being in a different place and doing the internship. Um, it just, it honestly just depends on what you want to do. Um, for us, we actually have a lot of internships that are not even in the United States. And so we've had students go to the ICC in Paris um, and work, work there. Um, so it really just depends on, again, what's your purpose? What are you looking at doing? What kind of connections are you looking at making? Where are you looking at building your career, whether it's in the United States or outside? Um, but, but looking at location can certainly, can certainly play a role. Um, even looking at what professional organizations are located within that region. Um, uh, if there are other organizations that you can connect with um, outside of the academic program. But good question. What other questions can I answer? Uh, could studying to the bar also benefit students who would work internationally? Um, again, realistically, it depends on what you're looking at doing. Um, again, um, NYU studies that asked international law firms or whether or not they wanted their associates to have, have passed the U.S. bar exam um, kind of determined that, they, that, that it wasn't as helpful. Um, it just depends. Keep in mind that sitting for the bar exam is a big decision. I always tell kind of am transparent with applicants that it could cost a student uh, close to $5,000 to sit for the exam. So the exam itself may be um, one or $2,000 depending on the state. In addition to the cost to register for the exam, you will have to typically do um, a bar prep course. So that's another $2,000 for the bar prep course. In addition to that, once you've, once you've taken the bar, you do have to fly back several months later for the swearing-in ceremony in order to uh, keep that credential. And then once you're sworn in, then, then, then you actually have membership in the bar. Uh, but in order to keep your membership, you'll have to do continuing legal education credit. So it's actually a big commitment to be able to uh, pass, take the bar, pass the bar, and, as well as maintaining that bar record. Um, and so. It's, it's, I always recommend to applicants, look at the organizations that you're looking at working with. You know, look at the credentials for the attorneys in the jobs that, that are currently at that firm and look, look at and see whether or not they actually have, the, the, have passed one of the bar exams and whether or not it's important for the organization. By starting, at, by starting with your old organization and looking at the credentials required, that will then actually help dictate whether or not it's necessary. For many organizations, they do want to have that international degree. They do value um, having an international LLM because it really adds to, to um, the prestige of that, that law firm or organization. But sitting for the bar can be a different story. Um, for those students that are going through and, uh, a specialized LLM program, taking the requirements for the bar may take away from the depth of what you can get in that specialized program. Um, so there's really pros and cons um, varying depend, depending on what you're looking at doing. Keeping in mind, in an international environment, you're not going to be practicing law in the United States. So it may not actually be necessary. Now I was seeing that there were some issues here and hopefully that that was able to work work itself out and hopefully you've been able to hear um, me talking.
Perfect. Um, one of the other element I, I want to kind of point out is when it comes to looking at programs in the U.S., um, don't be afraid to reach out to the people that administer some of those programs and see if there are other opportunities to kind of engage. I know, you know, I've been doing like little Skype tours where I will walk people around the building or I've been doing things where we have our own um, online webinars and can learn about a program. But Typically, you know, a lot of LLM, LLM programs are fairly approachable when it comes to asking them if you can talk to a local alumni. Will they refer you to someone that's kind of in your home country that you can talk to about their experience of having gone through their, their LLM program? So don't, don't be afraid to reach out to some of the schools, learn a little bit more about the options, and ask if you can connect with one of their local alumni. Sometimes that can be very helpful not just learn from their experience, but see how it helped them in regards to where they are today. Um, so another question, could you tell us about the strengths of Pepperdine Law's program? Um, sure. And so um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of our biggest strengths, uh, and again, the department I work for, is the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution. We've been the top-ranked program um, for 11 of the past 12 years. Um, uh, as a note, Harvard floats between three and four. Um, and so uh, it's, it's very well regarded. We have over 52 different classes in the field of dispute resolution. We offer uh, symposiums. We offer uh, training programs, we have um, 29 different countries represented within our LLM program, but we're not that big of a program. Um, we also have a series of different guest speakers that come in uh, and talk with students. So for example, uh, today we had uh, Ambassador Ask from Norway that uh, Skyped in and talked from DC to talk with students about Norway's approach to peace and reconciliation. Uh, we had Lucy just recently is, uh, from from Singapore, uh, talking to our students about international commercial arbitration, as well as Maria Ciudad, um, in a, a sequence uh, on ICA earlier this week. We have Tom Stefano, who is one of our faculty members, who is the most referenced researcher in the field of arbitration by the Supreme Court, giving a talk uh, this week on Lincoln's use of uh, dispute resolution, um, you know, conflict resolution. And so uh, we're, we always try to provide opportunities to engage students directly in the field, um, in addition to, to kind of provide networking opportunities for students. Um, what I really like about our program is it really is about community. Uh, you know, all the students are kind of accepted as easy as it sounds into our, our family. We actually. For the LLM students coming in, we will actually try to note when people are coming in and actually within our office, make arrangements for a different one of us to pick people up from the airport to kind of bring them to campus, whether if they're living on campus or off campus. We have a colleague in my office that will help our, our students find a place to live. And so um, I like it because of that sense of family. I Every time I travel to recruit, um, I can meet up with alumni all around the world that can, can kind of connect me uh, with the community or just, you know, someone to have breakfast with and touch, touch base with. And so that, that community uh, element does make us a little bit unique. Any other questions on the on the programs or maybe the application process? As I and, and just to take one more opportunity to point out, we do have several full tuition scholarships. That deadline is on Friday, um, not this week, but next week on March third. Um, so for those that are interested in our particular programs, I do recommend you apply for a full tuition scholarship. That way, you can have a chance at getting something. Our JAM scholarship is open to anyone from any location as long as you're applying for one of the five dispute resolution LLM programs.
And so again, it's a it's a two page essay in addition to an application for the LLM program. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for making yourself available that early in the morning at your end and for presenting uh, to us that elaborate session. Um, I also thank you for being encouraging towards the students and asking them to be proactive and reach out to schools if they feel the need, because sometimes we see students shy away from doing that and they're not sure if that's, a, that's an okay thing to do at all. Um, thank you attendees for joining us and for asking your questions. You have Sarah's email up on the slide and I'm sure she'll be happy to uh, hear, uh, hear from you and take questions from you should you have any for her. With this I would like to wrap up today's session and I would just like to notify everybody saying that the session has been recorded and it's going to be uploaded on our YouTube channel sometime very soon. So March beginning sometime uh, you should have this up and it's going to be available for access. Uh, just to let everybody know, the coming week we are meeting again, Friday same time, and the webinar is going to address a topic titled Adjust Adjusting to a U.S. College, and the presenter is going to give you tips to have a rewarding U.S. college experience. With this, I would like to wrap up today's session, draw this to a close. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you again the coming week. Thanks, and goodbye.